Good morning. Let's um, give a chance for everybody to get here. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, we'll give you a few. Anne is here. Wonderful, guys. This is great. Yay, Marianne. Thank you for letting us know. Yeah, you guys, we're going to be making this kind of a regular thing on Mondays. I'm hoping Lisa will be able to join me, but she um, is taking precious time out of her Monday morning, and she's an hour earlier than me, so you guys, I'll give Lisa a big thank you. <laughs> I'm here, though. Woohoo! I figured out how to get me on there. <laughs> yeah, everybody's saying hello. And uh, let's see here. Hello um, from Holland, uh, Elska, Shiloh and Bonnie. I'd like to be doing these lives uh, on a Monday morning because Mondays typically are not my most active day. And so if anybody else had like, what, whatever you think about Mondays, just pop it in chat. Like, are Mondays your favorite day? Are Mondays your big art day? Because for me, it's like um, my, I just have to get things in motion. So part of why I'm doing this live is to get things in motion. And I want to take you guys with me and let's all go in motion together. Uh, and today I'm doing a demo. Okay, so today what I'm doing is uh, basically automatic drawing. And I've talked about this wonderful book by Stephen Imoni. It's right here. Okay, and I know it's out of print, right? So, uh, it, you know, you can go on Amazon or eBay and if you luck out, you might get a copy, but don't worry, because uh, if I do a demo here, and certainly in the Art and Success Pro membership group, we're really uh, doing much more than I'll ever do on YouTube. But um, in any case, this is the book that, uh, that I will be working from this morning. Let me read to you what it says about automatic drawing, because today's demo is about automatic drawing, and I'm going to be doing it in two different mediums. Uh, and the reason for that is simply because uh, I'm a great believer that the way that I paint anyways, it's not about the medium. It's about whatever you think about design. Design is always like king. And then the techniques and mediums and, you know, you can work in five mediums or 10 mediums. It's still just one you. But the way to make you look like you in all 10 mediums is to, to truly understand the principles and elements of design because that's your vocabulary. And so once you understand your vocabulary, it doesn't matter what medium you're working in. So less emphasis on the medium and much more emphasis on let's just paint and make it as personal as possible. So in this book, for those of you who have it, I'm looking at page 24, okay? I'm just gonna read a little paragraph about what automatic drawing is according to Stephen Imoni because he is the author of this wonderful book. The idea in itself was a simple one, to draw with no plan, no purchase, no conscious control, to begin generating line and mark in a seemingly random fashion. Those early modernists believed that this kind of drawing could reveal levels of awareness and meaning impossible to divine in any other way. In essence, they advocated de-emphasizing the role of the conscious mind so that a different level of intelligence subconscious or unconscious could emerge. This kind of intelligence they felt could make the invisible visible or give form to the formless. So you might just think that what these uh, examples are may look like doodling to you, right? But actually these are examples of automatic drawing as well as on the cover, automatic drawing. Let me show you some more examples here. This is a Jackson Pollock, uh, okay. And then I'll just give you a few other examples here. Here are students of Stevens doing uh, automatic drawing. So as you can see, it, it doesn't really, re it's not a question of you guys having like a value sketch or you've done something in your sketchbook and you're like, okay, I'm gonna sit down on a Monday morning and I'm gonna paint this barn. It's not like that. Uh, the idea here, it's kind of like a warm up. But what I found, because uh, my left brain often kind of likes to call the shots and hijack my right brain, which is the creative side, is I had to figure out a way to get myself into right brain mode, which is the creative side. And one of the best ways to do that is just to start drawing without any thought, without a plan, and just let it go where it's gonna go. All right. Now, as far as chat goes, guys, um, 
I will be focusing on what I'm trying to demo. And then Lisa will be watching chat. If you guys have a big question about something I'm doing at the time, you can uh, write in all caps question to alert Lisa to that. And she might ask me the question while I'm actually doing the demo, which is fine. And I'll say, if I can answer it, I will. Feel free to put your questions in there and feel free to comment as I do this. So what I have here, uh, I'm gonna be doing two different mediums, but I'm doing the same thing, all right? Because if I was working in oil and cold wax medium, which is what this says here, I would start my painting the very same way than if I were working in <laughs> acrylic, okay? Uh, now, there are differences, of course, but uh, I will point those out as we go. But my process needs to be the same no matter what medium I'm working in in order for me to get to love the process, right? If I love the process, I will show up a lot more in my studio than if I don't love the process. So, uh, so let me just begin with, uh, I'm going to talk about oil and cold wax medium first. And the reason for that is because, uh, and if any of you guys are working oil and cold wax, you might want to just say uh, yes in the chat or, you know, let us know how long you've been working this medium. But it is a little bit more, there's, yeah, there's a little bit more involved, but, you know, just a few things. So this is my palette for oil and cold wax medium and automatic drawing is really focused on drawing, but it's it's also focused on mark making and, you know, let's just say painting, right? Because it's automatic. So whether you paint, whether you draw, the idea is to not think. So the, the, the two words for today are to not think. And I hope a lot of you are gonna be painting with me because that's the whole idea. It doesn't matter what medium. It, you don't have to even be working in acrylic or oil or cold wax. Real simply here, I've got my uh, Gamblin's cold wax, okay? It looks like shortening. Don't ever confuse this with Crisco shortening because that's what it looks like. So what I typically do in my studio, um, this is a medium. And the beauty of this medium is that if you paint with oils, which is what I'm going to be doing here this morning, you don't have to worry about, you know, basically, I'll just say it, and I won't say much about it, but the concept of fat over lean which has to do with, you know, if you look at old master of paintings and they're all cracked and they didn't know about fat over lean. They, they, they found out kind of the hard way, right? So we're learning from the master's mistakes and, and we're figuring out that we need to just, like if we add cold wax medium, you don't have to even worry about fat over lean. So that was all for me. I didn't want to touch oils until I learned about cold wax. So this is the medium that I use. And what I'm showing you here is how I make my, cold wax uh, medium a little bit stronger because it can be a little brittle. So just for those who are interested, and I'll try to make this really fast, I just flatten it out and then I divide it into four sections. Then I add my Galka gel here, which is also made by Gamblin. And I talk all about this in, in, in many videos and as well as in my courses on uh, how to work with cold wax medium. And my powerful design and personal color course, a lot of you are already in that or have taken it. You know that I show you a lot about this medium. And but it's not about the medium, that course is about color and design. So once you've got your Delta gel, now keep in mind this is a gel, which just means that it's a little stiffer. Okay, it's like toothpaste. So if you're trying to add something like toothpaste to something that like this white mass here is a bit, you know, thick, right? But uh, it doesn't matter whether it's the gel or the liquid. Okay, so now you just wanna mix it up like this, mix it really well. The thing about the Gelka gel, the re there are four reasons why I add it to my cold wax medium. When you add it to your oils, it gives strength and flexibility to your final painting. So who doesn't want strength and flexibility? Um, at the end, it gives a very slight satiny look to it instead of like total matte. And so that can be really nice. So that's three things, strength, flexibility, slight satin. And the fourth thing is probably something that most people love, and that is that it speeds up the drying a little bit. Now, I'm using Galka gel, but I could also be using the Galka liquid. Um, there we go. Okay, so these are the same thing. It's just that one's liquid and one's like a toothpaste. So you can choose either one. It doesn't matter which one. Okay, so now that I've mixed this 
I'm going to be using this all week. So what I'm going to do is leave some here because of today's demo. But then I have a tin and I've just uh, labeled it with um, this one to three G gel. Okay. It's, it's a lid. Sorry. It's a container <laughs> that. Can... Sorry. <laughs> okay, there. It's there a... we go. <laughs> yeah, it's... You're great, Lisa. You're awesome. Get the container that can hold any excess cold wax and oil medium for at least a week, if not longer, you know. And I mean, that's an advantage because you just kind of don't want to waste this stuff. So what there I do There are is I... a couple of questions, Pam. Um, yeah. Carol asked, why is the Galka gel needed? And um, what was the ratio of Galka gel to cold wax? Yeah, one part of Galka gel to three parts of cold wax medium. And I did just say there are four advantages, right? Strength, flexibility, right. drying time, slight satin, okay. all right? Okay, great. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, we're gonna focus now on my palette here, right? I have squirted out some ivory black paint. Now, if you want to, a uh, couple things, um, don't ever go past one to one. We're talking proportions here. You, you guys understand which proportions are. This is less than one-to-one, -one, right? If I just do this, I mean, that's getting close to one-to-one. -to -one. Can you see that? And I'm looking at this versus this. This is just black paint. Now, if, I'm just going to say if. If you wanted to work on canvas, um, you, you want to have a lot less of this. You want to have, like, less than 25%, but I'm going to actually go up to one to one and because that's what Gamblin says you can do. You're gonna mix it up, all right? So that's ivory black mixed up one to one with my cold wax medium that has Galka gel. And now it's going to dry faster. It's gonna be stronger and more flexible. You know, some some artists, I, I remember early on when I was learning this medium, they were saying, oh gosh, my, my painting chipped in the corner. Why is that? And I called Gamblin colors and uh, because they make the products that I like to use. And they said, oh, well, if you add Delta gel, you're adding strength and flexibility to your surface, right? So that's why I do it. I've got Arches oil paper. That's what I'm working on at the moment. All right, so now the whole thing is automatic drawing. That's what we're doing. But I wanted to get all that stuff mixed up and get it out of the way. So my favorite surface is either Arches oil paper or an ampersand panel, which I also have one of those all set and ready to go so i might start that one as well um for those of you who like encaustic board um here is an encaustic board and then notice i've taped off the edges with blue tape keeps it clean um this is the most wonderful surface that i have ever found for working with um oil and cold wax medium and i tend to have lots of sizes available ready to go because i just love the surface so now we're going to go back to like how do you start your painting and i've got here um all of these things here which uh i'll tell you what they are but you have different things and it doesn't matter what it is this is mega graphite and uh this one is uh conti pencil pastel pencil this is a marabou uh, soft type thing. Um, this is a, a charcoal stick. I've got erasers. I've got art graph. And I know you guys have a lot of the same things. A number two pencil from grade school. I've got a <laughs> Palomino <laughs> black wing pencil. I have uh, my, my favorite is um, this <clears throat> 8046 water soluble guy. The thing about working on cold wax is you don't have to worry about things that are water soluble like art craft. Okay, so let's start with some, that's just now automatic drawing. Like what I think about is nothing. <laughs> so Mondays for me, plus nothing, no thought, that's a great combination. And that's why, that's why I'm here. <laughs> and that's hopefully why you're here too. And I want you to be doing this with me. You could be at your kitchen table. Uh, you have either your sketchbook or just a piece of paper. I'm not thinking, I'm just, you know, Think of it as kind of your morning, Monday morning calisthenics. I'm, I'm experimenting with different things. Like what kind, how dark, how dark is this Conti Paris uh, pastel pencil, right? And, and it doesn't have to be dark. It can be dark, but then it can be light. So, so 
you're not thinking, but at the same time, yeah, the guide for you can be contrast. So think about going slow, um, uh, fast. Like, what does a fast mark look like? What does a fast, soft mark look like? And I'm not thinking, I'm just, these are prompts, right? Because sometimes we just want to, like, have a little bit of guidance. We're not thinking. Now, this is another pencil. I'm getting a feel for what do these things do? And here's my Marabou. This is a really nice, juicy, it's like lipstick. And that's a fun one, right? So I wanted to start out with the dry medium because obviously you don't have to wait and let that dry. Now the thing about working oil and cold wax medium is that there is a drying time. You have to have a little bit of patience or instead of patience, if you're not a patient person like I am not, but I want to work in cold wax and oil, here's a carpenter's pencil, then uh, the way to get around not having a lot of patience is to have like 10 of these going at a time. So this morning I might start 10 of these. Some of them are in orange oil paper, some of them are on ampersand panel, doesn't matter, right? Now, um, so now we're gonna get into the paint part. So I've got this uh, juicy paint and you know that's part of the automatic drawing process as well. So what I wanted to show you is that um, a lot of artists ask me, how do you work with drippy paint in cold wax and oil? And sorry, if you're, if you're an acrylic painter and you're just like waiting for me to get to the acrylic part, don't worry, that's coming soon. I just wanted to get this going so it can dry a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is take some of my uh, paint that I just mixed with cold wax medium, and I'm going to uh, put it into this little glass jar so that I can make it more liquid because that's what you're trying to do, right? If you want drippy paint, then this is like paste and you want it to be more drippy. So how are you gonna do that? Um, partly I need to use my silicone. I'm using silicone tools because I like silicone tools, but I also want to show you how to use a brush because uh, that's what you can use when you use drippy paint. So I'm just getting it into this jar like that. And I'll keep these tools aside because they, they're mark making tools as well. So essentially, uh, this is what I have in here. You can see there's not much in there. Okay, now <clears throat> keep in mind that I just combined my cold wax medium with my Gelka gel, which is like the toothpaste consistency. One to three. Well, what if you can't get the gel? I've done the same thing here, very same proportion, one to three here. There's the label. I do label everything here. And notice this is one to three, Galkid Gamsol. The difference is that instead of the toothpaste kind, I use the liquid, right? So one part of this guy, and then three parts of Gamsol, which is really just an odorless mineral spirit. Same, really the same chemical composition. The only difference is that this is a liquid, right? Unlike the Crisco that's sitting on my palate. And the reason I'm telling you that is because if I want to go um, liquid with my oil and cold wax medium, then I'm going to have to do something to this paint in here. And I'm going to add, I've got a little medicine dropper here, and I'm just going to, and I don't really need a medicine dropper. I can just dump it in, I can see now. So I'm going to dump it in. And I don't, I'm just guessing, like there's no, no formula. Now I'm going to uh, stir it up with my palette knife and get it kind of liquidy, right? Because I want it to be drippy. You want that paint to kind of dissolve in the liquid. So hopefully you can see that what's happening there. I mean, look at it. Now this is just not the same consistency as what was on my palette. And we've got a nice container now full of drippy paint. If I add more black paint to this, it will be thicker. Now that I've added that to the uh, paint, I've got a liquidy sort of concoction there. So I've got a brush and then I've got my little container here. So I'm mixing it up now with my paint brush. And uh, if you guys like drippy paint, you know, keep in mind that it, it, it is gonna take a little bit longer for you to dry it. But again, if you're working on 10 things at a time, you're gonna set this aside and just let it dry it might take a few days that's okay because you're working on so many other things so i'm really making sure that i get this into a uh, solution here and, and uh, pam you're mixing oil paint into 
my one to three Galkid to uh, Gamsol. Okay. Okay, so now look, it's like a wash. I mean, you can work with cold wax and oil and it's like a wash. And that's, that's really great, right? And yes, you can do the whole dripping thing. The reason I did this on paper at first was so that I could actually show you if I just dump some of this on it, you can see how liquidy it is, right? And look, I mean, you can get it to move around just fine. Somebody's asking if they can use that to paint a line on top of it in caustic. No, uh, if it's the last thing you do, it's okay. In other words, when you transition into cold wax and oil on top of an encaustic, um, unless you're gonna remove almost all of it, you don't wanna fuse any solvents and solvents are Gamsol. Right, and, they would be better off to use um, India ink. Yes, right. Yeah, they're, right, that's a great question. Okay, so you can kind of see how in time, you know, if you turn this thing around, and I, I did this on paper so I could actually flex it and turn it around, but you can see how you can get, you know, again, automatic drawing or That's automatic super paint. super fun, Pam. Thanks, Lisa. Now, now I've got this, right? But what about my thicker paint? I've got this thick paint now and I've got a silicone tool, which, you know, one of my favorite things to work with. And look, you can do that. And you can make all kinds of interesting marks like that. You can take a brayer. I want to show you guys. So I just want to show you this real quickly. This is um, <laughs> these are some tools I made a while ago. And there's a there's a YouTube video on like I, I use these paste double ended pastry rollers and I covered them with nail cream. So like these are tools that you can make yourself. I'm a big believer in like making your own tools because why, why not? Right. They're, they're original. Um, nobody's going to make the marks that you make. These are just all like neoprene that, you know, and, and there's a video on YouTube on how to do this. But the reason I'm showing you this is because, you know, if I take say this guy that I made and I don't, you never know what the results will be. Right. But if I take this guy and I roll it into my thicker, flat paint, let's just see what happens here. I'm just, uh, so this is how you charge a brayer. You just, and you can see that the neoprene is hopefully picking up some of that paint. Those are great tools, Pam. Yeah, they're, they're pretty bizarre. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I showed how to make these in, in some workshops a long time ago. But anyways, let me, let me get this out of the way. But look, there's like even a old um, linen roller uh, like it has the double-sided sticky tape for getting like lint off clothing and stuff like that. Put some like an interesting fabric on there. And so I turned it into a tool. That's and great. So now, so now here's this guy and let's just see what kind of a mark it makes. Okay. So now you, you just charge it again in your oil paint and what is neoprene and where do they get it? <laughs> well, if you look it up on Amazon, you'll find it. They're, they're a, uh, adhesive. Uh, it's like fabric. Like, you know, there are there's clothing made of neoprene. Um, a scuba diving suit is neoprene. And you can get it with an adhesive back. And, and that's what I did for these tools. And then I just cut into the neoprene and I adhered it to my tools. Okay. And, and I cut in, like I cut into the neoprene here and then I stuck it onto the pastry roller. And then I did put PVC, um, like some kind of sealer. You could use like a gloss medium or whatever you want to do just to seal it in there. Those are great. All right. So then, uh, you know, other things would be like, you can mono print with, um, cold wax and oil. I love to mono print. So here's my uh, roll of just brown paper that painters use. And it comes in all different lengths and you just like, you don't have to use this. You can use newsprint if you want, but um, since I have it here, you can put it on a thick, juicy uh, area of paint like this. And just, well, first of all, let's just do the simple thing. <laughs> so you just lay it on top of a patch of paint like this and you press it like this. You lift it. Now see what's on the paper. 
And now you can move that over to some other place. And there's still some pink on it, so you can keep moving around like this. Now it's also getting into that liquidy stuff, but that's fine, right? I don't really care, like even that's cool. What if I transfer this liquid part? Can I do that? Probably. So the main thing you're asking is like, what if, right? What if I do this? What if I do that? So essentially, um, this is automatic drawing, and you can go back into, like, I would want to let these guys dry, but at the same time, you can come back in and, like, here's my brush again, and, you know, you can, you can work back into this in any way that you want, and you can see, like, all you're doing is you're, you're observing what happens. Like, what I observe when I do this, this is a lighter value than that. Um, I'm not thinking, I'm just observing. And the more you do this, and you can save some of these early automatic drawings. I had one student, uh, maybe that was um, Tammy, who <laughs> she did an automatic drawing and she framed it. And I thought, well, then why not? Because sometimes they're going to be some of the coolest things you ever do. So now, like what I'm doing is I'm just, what am I doing? I'm exploring my brush. I like to use the word explore or experiment. Right now I'm experimenting. What can my brush do? You know, what if I touch this wet area and then come into a dry area? What happens if I look at this little area and just mush it all together? Like now I'm creating a bit of shape, right? But I'm still using my brush and I consider this to be automatic painting, drawing, whatever. What happens if... I go into this marabou crayon and then it does, what happens to it? Does it get nice and dark and juicy? Yes. What happens when the brush runs out of paint? What does that look like? Well, now I've got a bit of a dry brush here. So I'm just playing. I'm playing. I'm not thinking. But I am observing because I'm an adult. A child, um, I'm like a child. Uh, I'm an adult. And so I can observe and remember, whereas a child would just be doing this without you know, they're doing the same thing I'm doing. The only difference is that I will remember. <laughs> they probably will not until they get older. So that that's essentially what um, I think of as automatic drawing. Now, it doesn't matter. Again, this is, you're going to see how this is going to look a lot like what I do with acrylic. And so I'm trying to emphasize that it's not about the medium. Um, it is about automatic drawing which can be done in any medium you could have a colored pencil you could have one pencil you could have a crayon um and then like i didn't really show it too well on here but the other thing you can do let me just move this out of the way uh, the other thing though now this is an encaustic board right here so we're still kind of in the oil and cold wax medium uh demo here but i guess what i wanted to really show you is that um Automatic drawing and, 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 and you know, I'm going to be, I do this all the time. Like, this is how I start my work. Do I expect any of these marks to make it to the final painting? Well, not necessarily, but if they do, great. And if they don't, that's okay too. Because I can always put marks back. So right now, I'm just doing this automatic drawing. And I want to kind of make it chaotic and crazy. I'm going to just take my art graph. Really see how, you know, I'm holding on its edge, it's that light. This forward a little bit. Just want you to know that this isn't oil and cold wax medium uh, board anyways. It's not, not oil and cold wax yet. But let's say I do something like this. I want to make it really uh, dense in terms of these marks. So I'm going to just grab all kinds of things. You can grab three things at a time and do that. Oh, and then there's graphite powder. I didn't show that, but graphite powder is one of my favorite things to use. I've got a little cotton cosmetic, you know, makeup remover here. Um, works lovely. For that and, and the reason I want to show you like all these different ways of putting on marks is because um, you're putting things on you just fill in some of this white some of you like one of one one person recently said um, they finished their painting and they're really disappointed 
because some of their gesso canvas still showed and they didn't, you know, they didn't want the canvas to show, but they loved the painting, right? So can you guys see how this sets you up for, number one, you don't have a, a, a white surface anymore. I mean, you really have done something to this anyways. And it's not nearly as intimidating as just a white canvas or that kind of thing now. Keep in mind that your eraser is your friend, right? Because you can you can draw into that as well. Um, so you you know the automatic drawing that you do can go on for quite some time. Try out like different erasers. Um, I mean, you only have this one right now, but you know how does it work in graphite versus like some of these other marks? Can I use it to smear? And that's the other question. What if you know a lot of people are so concerned about delicate marks and Okay, so I want to show you that this is, these are delicate marks. Some of them are water soluble, some are not. What happens when I start to add cold wax medium to the top? Because that would kind of be my next step. If I were going to move on into a painting, I'm going to start to add colors and, you know, move paint around. Well, what happens to these delicate marks? So what I'm going to do is clean off my silicone tool here, and maybe I'll take a little wider one. So I've got different widths, right? And on my resource page, I do list a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you right now. I mean, I should just mention that. Okay, so now I put a blob there, right? And I, I just want to show you that, look, there's just not a whole lot of um, change in the surface. Like, that's one thing I really like about um, the dry mark making on, say, a, a board like this. It's one of the things that you're not quite as worried about because you're not adding water to these water soluble marks like you would be in acrylic, which I'll show you in just a second. So notice how I can I can do this and notice how grungy the uh, cold wax medium is getting. But look at with this tool, I can scrape it back to almost it being really really you know pretty clean again, anyways. Um, but the point is that. You have a lot of uh, flexibility with your panel, and you know if, if it's getting too dark, it's picking up too much graphite or whatever it's doing. Um, you can save this and mix it with your paint later. You're not wasting it. So I'm going to put that onto my palette here and save that for later, and then I'm going to clean off this tool just with paper towel. You don't need anything else. It just comes really clean with the paper towel. And then come back in here again. And again, see, look at how beautiful that mark is retained. I didn't lose any of it. So how long is the saved paint good? Well, uh, if you keep it in a tin like this, and I, I did it in two ways. Like when I was at the grain studio, I had a refrigerator. Um, it had way more art supplies than it ever had food in it. And so as long as you're not combining stored art materials with food, you could keep a tin like this in the refrigerator and it would actually last a long, long time. And that's true for your oils mixed with cold wax medium, or let's say you squirted out some oils and you didn't use it all up. You can store that in the refrigerator as well. But if you don't have a dedicated refrigerator, then uh, it, it still keeps for a good week, if not two weeks. And you could drop just a few drops of gams all over the top of your oils and they'll keep it fresh. Make sure you've got a tight fitting lid you know, that's pretty important. Um, somebody asked about brushes. What brushes do you suggest? A brand or anything specific when you're doing oil and cold wax? Well, my favorite, now, there are two, two types of main tools, I would say, if you're working with cold wax and oil. And my favorites, you know, would be like these silicone, they're called silicone scrapers. Um, they come in a lot of different sizes. Uh, this one is, I haven't cleaned these, so they don't look that great. But um, yeah, this is what they look like, all these different sizes. And they're pretty easy to find. And I do I do list them on my resource page, but they come from, you can get them you know, from Dick Blick or I get mine from Amazon. Just any oil painting brush will work if you like the drippy paint, right? Just make sure it's an oil painting brush and vary the sizes. If you're working large scale, you're gonna need a large brush. If you're working small scale, then of course, you know, brushes like these will do uh, just fine. So you have to look at like the size of what you're working on. That determines the size of your the tools that you're going to be using. And people don't often realize that when they scale up 
all of their tools really do have to uh, scale up, okay? All right, so I'm gonna just let this kind of dry a little bit and you know, you can, even after like, I don't know, 20 minutes to an hour, uh, what I've done on here can set up a bit. Now I don't have any white on my palette here. If I did, I would be able to move this a lot more forward, but I'm keeping it simple. Uh, for those of you who are doing this with me, I just have black, okay? Now, I will say that um, cleanup of your tools is super easy, right? Um, and, and don't let that stop you from, you know, say, using this medium. So when you're cleaning your tools, I have a paper towel. And like with my spatulas, I just get the majority off. And as long as you do it while it's still wet, the, the paint is still like wet, you know, that's done. That's ready to be stored. Um, brushes, what I'll do is I'll get the majority of paint out. So here's a tiny brush. Let's see if you can see it like this. Okay. And um, I just get the majority of paint off. And then I maybe a little bit of cooking oil. So what I would do then is grab my cooking oil and squirt it on my palette like this. And you're just going to rub it around until you don't really see any more. But you can see that even after the paper towel that I use, there's really not much paint or anything left in there. And you're adding oil so that, you know, keeps the bristles nice and pliable. Take your paper towel, get all the oil out. And now you're done. I mean, that's all you have to do. So I put that back. Um, as far as the brayer goes, you can kind of do a similar thing with oil to clean it out. Just get it all off like this and wipe it with a paper towel. Now this little clump here of cold wax medium, um, when I'm done for the day, I'll put that back in the container. And then with the black, I mean, I usually challenge myself to use up all the paint on my palette if I can. So that's why if you have multiple boards ready to go, then you, you don't have to, you know, you're not storing as much paint, which I like to do. Um, so if you have a limited palette and you've got say three colors and you've mixed up all these wonderful tints, tones, and shades, then you might have, you know, several boards ready to go with the intent of saying to yourself, okay, I've got this much paint. I'm going to start as many boards as I need to, or, you know, arches, oil, paper, whatever, until it's gone. And then you don't have to store anything. I mean, that's that's a challenge I give myself because I'd rather use it up than store it. I just don't like to have to store um, my paint if I don't have to. Let's well, see, Carol asked if you've done paintings in more of a representational abstract style. Okay, did yes I have. Um, in my early, you know, early watercolor days as a young mom, I did a lot of more realistic landscapes, I did people, I did still lives. Um, uh, yeah, I, I actually even went photorealistic for a while there. And um, it's good to try all these things because how do you know what you like right until you've tried it? And, and I always encourage artists to, especially early on in their careers, to uh, don't don't worry about your art not looking like one person. Um, your voice will come out. Um, it just needs to have a chance to make choices. And it's all about you know, the choices that you present to yourself. And if you go super photorealistic all the way to super Joan Mitchell or Jackson Pollock, maybe like, whoa, I'm not that and I'm not this. So I must be somewhere in between. And you will definitely have strong reactions to these ways of painting. That's the whole point. The whole point to push yourself into these extremes is to have a reaction. It's either going to be, wow, I love it, or wow, that's not me, or but then the second thing is, well, I love what I just did, but did I love the process to get there? So let's say you love photorealism. You like the way it looks. Um, say you're in a gallery and, and the gallery is like, oh yeah, we carry photorealistic work, but you're like, I, I love the way it looks, but I don't have a lot of patience. Therefore, this is not going to be a very good way to sustain me working in my studio because you don't have that kind of patience. So it's a matter of mixing and matching. Process is gonna be a, a very big part of who you become. Uh, the more you love your process, and that's one reason I just showed you what I do uh, when I started painting, because I love that. I know on any given day, I can walk into my studio and do automatic painting or drawing without thinking. 
So number one, that has become my go-to way of starting every single work. Whether those marks end, uh, end up showing in the final painting, I don't care. But the other thing is that if they get covered up and I liked it, it's like, I don't have that feeling of like, oh, shucks, it's gone because I can always add it back at any stage later. And I've done that at times. I've done some crazy automatic drawing at the very end. Jay asked if you ever worked on canvas rather than paper. And then also, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce pronounce this other person's name. Starts with a D, Devande. Uh, can cold wax be applied to dry acrylic paintings? Okay, so um, the first one, Canvas. Yeah, I am starting to work on Canvas, and there's going to be some videos coming to the YouTube channel. Um, I just finished a four and a half, four foot by eight foot painting um, that I began within our Art and Success Pro membership group. So a lot of us work together, uh, again, with the prompts from the Expressive Drawing Book. And we started and, you know, we worked on it for several weeks and I just finished it. So I'd say it took about a month and it's now off the wall, all rolled up. That was on campus. That was acrylic mixed media. But my goal um, is to transition into oils on canvas, but I do want to have a little bit of cold wax medium and I do want to be able to work on canvas. So I know that I've never taught that before. Um, the, the key to it then again is to have less than one part to three parts because that's 25%. If I keep my cold wax medium to less than one part to three parts, I'm now in an area where gambling color says it's okay to paint on canvas they say, well, probably best if you don't roll it, but I've got had friends who said, oh, they rolled it with no problem. So, you know, again, if you're willing to do a little testing and experimenting, I, I definitely like, I, and I also work with cold wax medium and oils on top of an acrylic painting. So I almost did it on this one. I almost transitioned into cold wax and oil, but I decided not to. The whole reason for doing it or not doing it has more to do with surface quality has to do with gradation, has to do with like solid areas of color and not showing any brush marks because, you know, different tools, different techniques and that kind of thing. Uh, the other question was working with uh, putting cold wax medium over an acrylic, Lisa? Yes, yes. And then there are a couple more now as well. Yeah. So basically I have a four step process for my acrylic paintings that do the final of the, those four steps is to apply cold wax medium in a very thin, thin layer to the surface and then buff it so it's nice and shiny, but satiny, not like an acrylic. So acrylic, as most of you know, is like a high gloss situation here. And so I do a four method, four step process where the final step is to rub cold wax medium very thinly, let it dry and then buff it. And I've had people say, wow, is, is that an encaustic? Or um, how did you do that with your acrylic painting? So <laughs> once I thought I could do it, and because I love the encaustic surface, that's what lured me to the medium. I felt like, okay, that, that's one more uh, checkbox in the cohesion column. If my encaustics can look somewhat like my acrylics, even though they're a different medium, that's a good thing, right? So a lot of us feel like we want to be recognized by our style and that comes down to cohesion, but cohesion comes after a lot of painting a lot of decision making, a lot of choices being made. Maybe you started with 10 mediums and you're, you're narrowing it down to five and then you're narrowing it down to three and now you're down to like the last two that you love. Maybe you've got a couple different bodies of work that are quite different from one another. I do that, but I found that I just, it, it's fine. You can actually do that. You never hear anyone talking about that, but the galleries that I'm in, they're fine with it and they've sold in, in all these different ways that I work. So don't get so hung up on, you know, I mean, people still know it's my work and it's just a matter of degree. 